MPAs because they um, are related, Chair? It's fine. I understand from my colleagues that yes. Uh, can I proceed, Chair? Please. Please proceed. Um, uh, from my colleagues um, that yesterday, there were quite a few um, queries regarding um, compliance and enforcement matters. So we've asked that immediately after these two presentations, Chair, if it's possible, that we then um, <clears throat> we then um, deal with uh, the, the compliance and enforcement presentation. Because a lot of questions that were asked will be dealt with. Um, unfortunately, I noted there's a few members that are not present today, um, but but uh, we hope that the questions were asked in the previous session um, will be um, addressed in that presentation, Chair. So without wasting any further time, Chair, I'm going to and over to Mr. Kobani Poposhe. Um, he's going to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair, and, and thank, thank you chair. to the Acting and DG. Uh, our presentation will be as be requested by the Chair, which is on marine special planning and also Sorry, on my... Uh, 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 Hello. Thank you to the Acting DG. Uh, Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear yeah, you. Okay, Chair. No, I was just saying, Chair, I'll just, as indicated by the Act in DG, I'll just go through Marine Special Planning, which is what the Act is based on. And this Act is a framework legislation, it's not replacing any other legislation. Marine Special Planning, the reason that we came up with this to the Operation Pagisa issue was the fact that in South Africa we do a lot of uncoordinated work. Any department uh, chair, when he's having a problem, just wants to create an act. And these acts are created independently and also the, that creates to us doing work uncoordinated as government. So this act was really meant to coordinate the work done in the ocean space in South Africa. Uh, let me move the technology now. Shego, oh. can you come please? Yes. On slide number two, Chair, uh, is just an outline of what the presentation will be containing. Sorry, the Chair, first... we see the slides. Sorry? Uh, there's no slide on my screen. Oh, I wonder why. Let me just check. There was a, there was a slide and then it's just disappeared now. Oh, yeah, no, this Microsoft Teams. Apparently, there's no slide in the screen. I don't know. It's not that much. It's not that much sharing. sharing. Mm. Uh, honorable members, can you see the slide now? <clears throat> yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you so much. And apologies for that. This uh, virtual meetings are very difficult. So this is a slide I was referring to. It's an outline slide of what I'm going to present to the honorable members. What will contain in the presentation? Excuse me, uh, Chairperson, uh, someone's microphone is on and it's making a lot of noise. Or oh, I don't know if it's the presenter who's got some noise in the background. It's really difficult to hear. Okay, let me try and uh, check here at home if I have anything, but I doubt, I doubt there's anything else, but I'll check. check. It's this noise in the background. Mm. Hello, honorable members, is that better? Oh, no, it's not. It's bad. So, is it better? 
It's okay it sounds better, Tobani. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Acting DDG. I think the problem is the children here at home. They just don't understand how important this is. They just make so much noise. But I'm try I try to contain them a little bit. Apologies for that again. As I was saying, this presentation will be about what marine special planning is and what was the need for this type of act and what is the timeline, the planning timeline for the act. The act is not replacing any other act. It's basically a planning uh, act which was not there before. And what are the challenges in the implementation of this act as was well uh, approved by the president and what will be the next step. Slide number three. As I, was, as I said earlier, uh, Honorable Chairperson, is that the reason for this act, this is a planning act. This act does not replace any other act. And the reason for this is that the ocean in South Africa is not homogeneous, homogeneous and all the resources are not evenly distributed across the entire mm -hmm. ocean space. And uh, South Africa, as we all know, has a rich biodiversity. As you can see in the screen, uh, this biodiversity has to be protected but what is uh, an anomaly is that in places where there's rich biodiversity, there's also rich resources, which are also required by other industries. Uh, next slide. So the definition of marine spatial planning as was defined by the National Working Group, because we had to come up with our own definition. Because marine spatial planning, yes, is a tool that is used, used worldwide uh, we said that it's an emerging process that is being implemented by increasing number of countries, including South Africa right now. And in South Africa, we see this as a government process of collaborating, collaboratively assessing and managing the spatial and temporal distribution of human activities to achieve economic, social, and ecological objectives. Uh, Chair, if you recall, uh, in our operation in the previous years, we have done these things independently, but the plan, the planning act is saying to us, let us look at this thing together as different departments and industries. If you look on your left, uh, it's a bit, I can't, uh, I don't have a pointer. In the past, we used to have an ocean space that is used only for shipping and uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, fishing. But now the space is getting increasingly busy on the right hand side. Hence, we need such an act, uh, uh, Chairperson. The next slide. This is uh, the question that we are asked all the time. But why this act? Uh, I mean, we said, as I showed you in the previous slide, is that slide, the ocean has many users with different interests that in the past have resulted in conflicts due to the lack of proper guidance on most appropriate use of an area from a holistic perspective. This act is not about the particular resource, it's, up, it's about, it's area based. What are we doing in this area? How are we gonna avoid conflicts? Because everybody wants to use the space. The next slide. So as a national working group, we started at the beginning when, when this group was composed, we had to ask ourselves, uh, Chairperson, as to an honorable members, what is our vision as South Africa on marine special planning? What do we agree to as different departments is that we want a productive, healthy, and safe ocean that is accessible, understood, and equitably governed and sustainably developed and managed for the benefit of all. I think this, the last sentence there, uh, Chair, was very important for us because the ocean has actually been characterized in the past in the sense that other people felt excluded. So we said this ocean must be managed for the benefit of all citizens of the country because all South Africans have a right to have an access in the space. And then the Marine Special Planning Authority, as, 
as shown in the slide, is that the Department of Environmental Affairs, which is now Environmental Affairs, Forestry and Fisheries, was designated by the cabinet as the link as a lead authority for marine spatial planning. In this capacity, the department will collaborate all authorities that have mandate in the South African ocean space and facilitate MSP process. And the MSP in South Africa aims at contributing to the country's national development goals through the NDP, through sustainable ocean development. So the slide is just showing that how is this work going to be coordinated as per the Act. Now, the current composition as per the Act of the National Working Group, which reports to the Director General's Committee as per the Act, which then reports to the Minister's Committee, is, is, is Defence, which is in this uh, context is Navy, Environment, Tourism, Mineral Resources, uh, Fisheries, Rural Development and Land Reform, Transport, Science and Technology, and the South African uh, SANBI, which is also just an agency of environmental affairs, and the SAMSA, and the PASA, the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, all these agencies are uh, supporting the different departments in ensuring that we do uh, get as much information as possible for the development of the South African Marine Special Planning uh, process and implementation of the Act. Next slide. The question that comes up all the time, Chair, when we present this work is what is it that we're talking about? How much of a, how much of a space are we referring to? Does this really require an act? Is this not too small? Is it too big, etc.? But if you look at the slide, uh, uh, honorable members, is that South African Ocean is much more bigger than the land territory. I mean, the uh, is the space is so big. I mean, if you look as well, the addition of the Prince Edward Island ocean space around the Maroon Island and the Prince Edward Island is that South Africa is actually a bigger space. Uh, the ocean is bigger than the land territory, meaning that as the resources dwindle in the terrestrial environment, more people would find a need to explore in the ocean environment and that ocean is also theirs. But how are we going to, to, to ensure that this is done in an orderly manner? We believe that the Marine Special Planning Act will assist us. The next slide. Now, the land-sea interface. Uh, I mean, the high watermark coastal management plans, as was presented by Radia Razak this morning, and also the work that is done by municipalities, the municipal special development frameworks, all these things have to be taken into consideration when we do implement this planning act. This slide, Chair and Honorable Members, is just to indicate the process that has been followed so far and where we're going. Before we had an act, we started the process of stakeholder engagement where in 2016 we had an MSP National Stakeholder Summit here in Cape Town and that process was actually influencing the development of the framework for marine special planning in South Africa which was ultimately gazetted in 2017 uh, and that framework is actually the same uh, process that is that influence the development of the act. The framework and the act. The framework is talk. The act is talking to the framework. So in 2019, uh, we had this uh, marine special planning act, and there were a lot of consultation. Chair, we had to go to all the coastal provinces, even in rural areas where people did not even understand why we need to do this. I remember, chair, we were asked. Uh, when we were in Dwesa Club in the Eastern Cape, uh, we were asked by the king or the chief, yes, the chief, that we can't come here to talk to his people in English. Let's simplify this the act in Corsa. And we had to find a way to do this. And this was led by the previous chair. And uh, it was actually quite a, 
educational process for us as well as officials and uh, we had to to develop this uh, new way of doing things by talking to communities which will be ultimately uh, affected by the development of such acts. So these are just the products which have been developed so far and also in 2020 which is what we are doing now is the national data and information report. We are collecting all the information we could get not only just from scientists, but also from communities and NGOs, etc., so that the best way to influence a decision chair in this process is to get as much information as possible. The next slide. Now, the most important thing, Chair, as per the Act, is that on Section 7 of the Marine Special Planning Act, it requires the national data gathering exercise uh, which is currently being undertaken to provide the development of marine area plans. The Marine Special Planning National Working Group is currently undertaking that process. And this is quite important because we, without this process, we are not going to be able to develop a plan for the future if we don't even know what's happening currently. So this uh, process has started, and uh, this is what would really influence uh, developing your development of this uh, process. And uh, the marine area plans, which, uh, as this workshop is about policy influencing uh, legislation, was actually uh, guided by the development of the white paper on the national environmental management of the oceans, where we foresee four bioregions, which is the first one, the eastern, southern and western and these bioregions were actually demarcated as per the ecosystems in the national uh, ocean space but there's that the fourth one which is around marion island which is quite a unique space uh, is probably about uh, uh, a few not a few kilometers maybe two thousand kilometers inward from cape town so it's actually another province, if you may want to describe it that way, of South Africa. Uh, and then I, this is just something I was describing now in that diagram. It's the Western Marine Planning Area, Southern Marine Planning Area, Eastern Marine Planning Area, Prince Edward Islands Marine Planning Area. The international boundaries in this case will be on the west and the eastern marine planning area, which is the our nearest neighbors, uh, will be Namibia and Mozambique. And through organizations like the Benguela Current Commission, we are able to work with Namibia to, to guide on what our process is so that what happens in Namibia does not affect us because the ocean doesn't know any boundaries. There are no fences which are dividing the ocean. Water just runs as far as you could for not really guided by walls, etc. And then the Prince Edward Islands, uh, Chair, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, is that our nearest neighbor there is the Republic of France uh, because of the island that is next to the Prince Edward Islands. So our first area plan, Chair, that we are developing as guided by the Act is a southern marine planning area, uh, which is one of the most productive fishing grounds in South African exclusive economic zone. It also hosts the oil and gas sector, which is on its developmental phase and requires significant capital investment. The, the issue here, Chair, is that there's so many resources for different industries. There's fish, there's oil. At some stage, if this is not carefully managed, it will affect the development goals of South Africa as by the National Development Plan. So we are starting with this area so that we are able to learn as much as we can in terms of this marine area planning process. The next slide. In terms of the information we have received so far, if you, if you can look at the map here, this is just the shipwrecks which we're able to, to map through the information we received 
uh, from arts, and, uh, science and, and technology, science and innovation department, and uh, other agencies. It just shows how busy is the space and what is the requirement as uh, needed for the development of this space. And in terms of geomorphology, which you share from the National Data and Information Report, geomorphology refers to minerals, etc. The Chepasin and honorable members could see that this is not easy. This is just, at some stage, it will get to a, a place where the biggest uh, economic value will have to be decided and uh, luckily this has to come to, to the portfolio committee at some stage once we develop the first area plan before approval it will have to come to the portfolio committee and these are the submarine cables uh, that are known of for now and this influence our technology and also connection Shepherdson. And this is how important our ocean is, because if we do not have this ocean, we will definitely battle in terms of our technology as well as South Africans. This is just the ports and harbors. We don't have ports and harbors if we don't have an ocean space. So the ocean space really provides such a lot of economic value for the country. And uh, uh, this is quite a valuable space Oil and gas exploration licenses is provided by PASA, which is Petroleum Agents of South Africa. Uh, from 2014, the numbers went up and licenses were given. And this is just uh, one of the most important uh, economic value. Yes, it will take you a long time to find things, but uh, as we are aware, Chair, around Mosul Bay, there's been some developments in, in the most recent future, and this is coming from this type of exploration. And then there's the uh, marine and coastal tourism routes. As we know, we know these ships that are docking in Cape Town, PE, Deben, etc. There's a lot of economic value because in the ports itself, a lot of local companies are actually given opportunities because the people on the ship itself will have to order food, they will have to order spares, and uh, hence this act is saying, let's share in terms of what the value is. And these are uh, coastal tourism routes as I was referring to. Now, Chairperson, what are the implications for the Director General's Committee? The, as per the Act, that committee is duly empowered by Section 8 of the Marine Special Planning Act to approve the Marine Special Planning Framework and provide commercial, provide recommendations to the Ministerial Committee on the Marine Special Planning. It's also supposed to approve the Marine Area Plans and provide recommendations to the Ministerial Committee on MSP and to nominate com competent officials and experts that will serve in the Marine Special Planning National Working Group. And uh, the challenges, uh, Chair, that we have had so far has been our normal challenge in South Africa is the sourcing of data. People want to sit with data in their computers. They don't want to share information. And uh, uh, we had to also uh, develop data usage agreements between the different departments and agencies for publishing permission and also where we're going to host this information. And uh, we have also developed uh, as a department the Oceans and Coastal Information Management System where we're hosting this information where you can go live and access as much information as possible. Yes, we're not saying that everything is there but this is some form of a guideline in trends as to what is it that is happening in South African ocean space. Person, uh, I could go on and on, but uh, I would like to end it there on Marine Special Planning Act. We are available, Chairperson and honorable members for any guidance or any questions that will be 
we will, will be asked by the committee and we could do more than what this workshop seeks to achieve. Thank you so much. This is all on MSP. Daddy, what are you doing? Daddy? Come on, man. Mm -hmm. I, I also apologize. I have children here, so hence the noise. <laughs> it's a difficult time of the day for children. It's a very difficult time of the, uh, of the year for all of us, but there's nothing we can't do. We won't have to do the work. We can't sit at home and do nothing. That's also true. Yes. Chapers. Oh, we lost the chair as well. Chair? Is the chair there? Uh, I think the technology is playing with yeah. us now. No, no, no. It's not playing with us. I'm there. <laughs> But I, I, I was putting uh, this, um, who, who, who is number one? You never asked. Honorable Paulson. Uh, number two. Honorable Labuskakhne. Honorable Labuskakhne. Number three. Okay, can we get the uh, Honorable Paulson? Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Mr. Poposi. Um, I'd like to know to what extent do you advise um, sea fisheries, or are you involved in advising sea fisheries on the levels of fishing stock um, that is available? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Thank you very much, Chair. I've got a few questions to ask. First of all, I would like to know and uh, know if I'm understanding correctly that the Marine Spatial Planning Bill that will provide for a Marine Spatial Planning Framework of that framework will map specific areas for specific activities. Like the Lupa Act on land, you you your plan for certain areas can be industrial, certain can be housing, and so on. In the marine area, in the, in the oceans, well, that the things for aquaculture, for uh, uh, oil and gas, for uh, 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 sea level explorations, whatever can take place there, will that be mapped uh, according to? scientific data on the resources and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, um, well, after that has been done, if, that, if my understanding is correct, what uh, authority will this act have in, in the licensing of these um, activities? Because if you, if you map them, and there's no uh, alignment between whoever um, uh, 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 authorized licenses according to these areas, uh, then I can't see any, 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 or oh, yeah, not much use of that. Although in my mind, that should be aligned. And then um, I also would like to know what is the idea of the, 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 uh, 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 the framework for the for, for this for this special frame for the marine sp uh, um, special framework. How long will it take to be to to do it? And then uh, a very important thing: uh, will will the department or not only maybe the department or will there be between the, the various departments or then one specific department be a database will they will you be able to develop your own database and keep that uh, up to date because as you've mentioned it is quite an, um, an onerous process to get all this information 
from other resources. Now that you've, when you've collated all this, uh, within two or three or five years, we should update it on a regular basis. Uh, and to go through this process every time that updated, uh, you know, updating needs to be done uh, will be a very frustrating process. So what is the plan in, in our own databases where um, these various things are linked to get the specific um, scientific data that, that we needed? Thank you. Thank you. Any other hand? Uh, can we then allow the presenter to respond to the questions? Uh, is the thank presenter. You, okay, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, for these questions. Uh, I will start with this, the most important one, which is the the co collaborating, collaborative effort of, of the different sector departments working together, which is including fisheries. The reason for us to get fisheries into the National Working Group and the DG Committee is us to provide, is provide is providing us a, a platform for us to discuss the issues which will be linked to fisheries. We, we, we will be in no way determining quotas, but this act then says to fisheries, uh, you need to consider the objectives of this act before you do anything. So we will not decide for fisheries, but fisheries cannot ignore this. And then the issue of data, yes, we this one is going to be a big issue going forward, uh, Honorable Chair. The scientific data and also data from communities and the rural groups, etc. The, the National Oceans and Coastal Information System is expected to deliver on this way. You can go live on any, if you require any information. For instance, if the Honorable Chair would want to check what is going on with the shipwrecks in our ocean. Uh, the Honorable Chair can be able to request that information from OSIMS, and that is the process that is currently being under development, and also there are people who are employed to run with that system, requiring information from everywhere. So, yes, it's gonna, I agree with the Honorable Member, it's, it's a big task because you have to make sure that we information of today is as relevant as today. Tomorrow there might be new new information, but uh, it's going to be constant the improvement that we would have to do. And this group, the National Working Group, is dependent mostly on information because we can't come to the portfolio committee and present nothing, no information. No, we did not get any information. We have to come and present what is it that we got. And uh, this is actually the cornerstone of this work, is information. Uh, I'm not sure if I've, uh, I've responded to all the questions, Chair. I think I've tried to clap them uh, at once. Yes. Now you have tried. Uh, if you have not uh, responded to all of them, we will still have time as we engage uh, doing our oversight. Can we then move to the next uh, item? I'm not uh, sure who is the presenter. Yes. Uh, I'm still the presenter, Honorable Chairperson. <laughs> okay, uh, no, no. The next, no, no. Uh, the, the next item is actually uh, one of the key items of the of this department, which is the marine areas. Marine area protection. What is it that we protect in our space? And what is it in this MSP process? What is it that we're putting in as environmental affairs in terms of ensuring that what we have today will be available in the future? Uh, the second slide. No, my slides are not moving now. Okay, yes, it's fine. So in this presentation, Chair, I'm going to talk about 
our newest marine rotated area network that uh, has been recently de uh, uh, declared in South Africa, which is the 20 network of marine protected areas. And this area was actually contribute is, is actually contributing about five additional percentage to the space. If you uh, go back to in South Africa, we had originally about 0.4 percent marine protection, which was actually which was actually quite small compared to the need for for marine protection in South Africa. And uh, with this network, we were able to add five percent. And, uh, and this also meets the Pakistan targets of marine protection. And the, in cabinet, uh, they also approved the 20 network of MPAs to be declared. And uh, we have gone all over the world to try and communicate as much as we can on these areas. Yes, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I will not go to each and every one of them. Otherwise, we'll be here the whole night. But what this network seeks to achieve is that it's connected to, to each other. We don't protect for the sake of protection. No, we want to protect here. It's protection of an ecosystem here because this ecosystem will support seabirds in another area. And uh, this is something that we, we are proud of as the department. And uh, we are currently seeking new information in terms of what is it that we still need to protect in South African ocean space. The next slide, oh, the next slide, oh, I don't know what's going on now with this technology. Okay, Chair, I think I got it right now. <laughs> uh, yes, the first one being the, the orange shelf edge, Namaka fossil forest, and all the different uh, MPs, for instance, some of them are an expansion of the existing MPs like Ismangaliso. We had to export, expand in the marine area of this. And also they are much taller offshore because the biggest weakness in South Africa, which was identified, was the fact that we are busy protecting the coastal environment. The offshore environment is not properly protected and this network is addressing that. For instance, one of the criticism coming from coastal communities is that we don't want to go offshore. What we want to do is just to tell people stop fishing here, because now we had to, with the additional 5%, we were able to achieve these objectives. And also, this work, Chairperson, would also influence in the Marine Special Planning Act, because this will be our contribution as the department in terms of what is it that we need to protect and what is it that we could do for the future? The next slide, this is what I've touched on already. Oh, these things now. Yes. And then the biggest issue, Chairperson, that we are always asked on, uh, you as South Africa, you as a department, you like to declare things. And you don't know how to manage this thing. And now the declaration of the 20 ne uh, network of MPAs, the next steps is that our DDG uh, has written a letter to the, to the executive of management of agencies because we can't manage these things on our own, which is Ismaili, so SMVLO, and also ECPTA in the Eastern Cape. And now Chairperson, we need to have a proper postings of the declared MPAs with agencies. And we are currently now busy with roadshows on the interpretations of the regulations because there's no point in developing regulations which are written by lawyers when people don't understand. In the communities, it's not easy to give them legal documents. You have to go there so, and explain them to them what this means to, 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 their, to their livelihoods. And uh, we are talking about the revival of MOA, which is DAF, which is now, is, is in our department, is not DAF now, which is fisheries for the offshore MPAs because they have the capacity, they have the vessels, uh, and also the budget review process to include the 20 MPAs. 
And then with that, then chair, our our next step after that, we have to co constantly do research and monitoring because you can't just stop now because you have declared 20 MPAs. We have to look at how effective has been your declaration and what is it that you could do in the future to make sure that you continue to to protect as much as you can. So, Chair, we, we are proud to... Sorry, we've lost sound. On what? Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you, Chairperson. I think that's, that's my story, Chairperson, for the evening in this regard. And thank you so much for the opportunity, honorable members. As uh, I've sh shared with you, we are available to go to much more detail as to what exactly are we protecting. It's just a pity that the, the time allocated does not allow us to do so. Thank you so much, honorable members. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, uh, honorable members? Honorable Abbas Kahi. Yes, we are number one, honorable Abbas Kahi. Okay. Go ahead and ask. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it's just one minor question. Um, you said that the 20 network for Pakisa Marine Protecting Areas has been approved by Cabinet and it needs to be declared. Now, I would like to know what is the process of declaration? So, has it been declared? And, and after declaration, uh, then the road shows and those things happening and then the regulations is following or should the regulations be done first and then it's been declared uh, what what is the time frame of that process thank you okay uh, can you respond to that question okay uh, thank you honorable member the the, the, this Pakisa MPA's uh, Honorable Chair took a long time where there were conflicts with different departments where oil and gas and mining would come up and say, uh, you environmental affairs, you just want to sanitize the ocean. We are busy dealing here with issues of poverty and economic development so that that had to be taken to cabinet for cabinet to make a decision and cabinet approved 20 out of the 22 which were presented to cabinet and regulations have already been developed and uh, declared after the approval from cabinets so that has been that has been done already but now when we have to go on the road shows which we're currently doing now is to further explain the regulations to our people because people don't understand this language which has been used by the lawyers and uh, we have to simplify it for them and uh, it's in line with our number uh, where we, we are guided that we have to further entrench the consultation process because even before this consultation did happen difficult uh, consultation process because for instance in areas like Ismangaliso we had difficulties there, the Honorable Chair, where communities were confusing the land issue with an ocean issue because people kept on saying that people came here and talked about the World Heritage Site and then what they ended up doing to take our land. So we hope that is not a similar process. So we had to explain those things and, uh, and thanks to, to members of this committee that uh, they supported us in our public consultation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can we then move to the next uh, presentation? Uh, who is going to lead us there? Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Um, yes. Go ahead, Francis. 
Who's got any uh, thank, thank you. Um, my name is Frances Craigie. I'm the, the Chief Director for Enforcement at the department. Um, I just wanted to check whether you're able to see my presentation. Yes, thank you. Great. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so I'm going to be talking very specifically to Chapter 7 of NEMA, um, which is what we really refer to as our compliance and enforcement um, chapter. Um, and you can see it, it really talks to what the Environmental Management Inspectorate is all about, our powers, our functions. Um, you know, and when people refer to the Green Scorpions, they are referring to, to the work that we do under Chapter 7 of NEMA. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, a lot of the provisions around the inspectorate were introduced into NEMA back in 2005. And it was really in about 2007 that we started actually implementing our powers. Um, what we tried to do through Chapter 7 was to really provide a single set of compliance and enforcement powers um, across all of the relevant officials at national, provincial and local authorities. So you would have heard a lot over the last couple of days about NEMA and all the um, specific environmental management acts. All of the compliance and enforcement powers in order to do the work in those acts is sitting within Chapter 7. And, and the idea around that was to really create a network of what we call EMIs or Green Scorpions with a unified identity. Um, it would also ensure greater consistency in terms of how we execute those functions. Um, and it cuts across all of the environmental areas from biodiversity through to protected areas, waste, air quality, impact assessment, as well as coastal management. So for example, the marine protected areas that we're hearing about now, the regulations are also um, compliance and enforcement is done by EMIs or green scorpions. So if you then look at the next slide and look at the EMI network, we've obviously have EMIs sitting within the national department, DEF, but also sitting within human settlements and water and sanitation. We then also have EMIs sitting in sand parks and Sandby, two of our entities, as well as Isimangaliso Wetland Park Authority. Then they are also at the nine provincial environmental authorities, the five provincial parks agencies, and we currently also have EMIs um, sitting within 64 districts and local municipalities, and I, I will talk a little bit more to that. So if we want to get into to the capacity and, and where that capacity is sitting, and sometimes it's just important to understand that within particular areas, um, you know, how many EMIs or compliance and enforcement officials exist, we annually put out what we call our NISA report. And you can then see over the different financial years what the numbers of designated EMIs were sitting within each of those institutions that I spoke about. So at the end of the 1920 financial year, you'll see that within DEF we had about 160 um, EMIs across both compliance and enforcement and across all the areas um, of, of the environment from coasts to oceans to biodiversity to pollution, waste, etc. Um, as I said, I'll come back to the capacity of, of the local authority EMIs. A number of years ago, we looked at a, a proper project that would look at how do we designate EMIs at the local authority level, not to take on additional work necessarily, but to do the work that the constitution enables them to do in any event, but to give them more powers um, to be able to do that work. And obviously a priority at that point was in terms of the, the Air Quality Act, particularly as they are the permitting authority there and are responsible for compliance and enforcement um, in relation to those licenses that they issue. But it also cuts across nuisance, waste, um, um, sanitation, et cetera. And the thinking was that the national legislation would give them additional power um, to actually carry out the functions they have to do in any event. And, and this slide just gives you a sense within each of the provinces how many local authority EMIs are there, and we have a breakdown even further into very specific municipalities um, in terms of our um, ability. So obviously now, because we have this network and because it cuts across so many different institutions, we need a mechanism to really bring the EMI together 
and to ensure that we have consistent, you know, we have a, what we call an EMI operating manual. Um, we have a lot of SOPs and we have a cooperative governance forum, which is what we call MinTech Working Group 4, which then reports up through to MinTech and MinMEC, so that it reports up through the HODs of the departments, the CEOs, and then obviously also up to the minister and the MECs. And then at, you can see at the bottom of the slide, we have a number of task teams, such as the National Compliance Forum, the Biodiversity Investigators Forum, the Rhino Anti-Poaching Committee, which are subcommittees then of that Compliance and Enforcement Working Group. And all of these forums then bring together the work of, of the different EMI institutions. We also, particularly because of the work we do, have key partnerships um, within various areas. Um, this is just to give you a very brief overview, of course, in terms of what um, the South African Police Service does. We work very closely with them. We, in fact, have a, a standard operating procedure where certain EMIs will carry um, criminal dockets instead of the police carrying them for what we call pure environmental crime. And then where there are other offences such as organised crime or other crimes involved, then the police would normally carry those dockets. Um, the NPA is critical, obviously, with regard to our criminal cases, as they're the ones that decide whether to prosecute or not and take the matters through the courts. Of course, SARS Custom is critical, um, particularly at the ports of entry, um, looking, for example, at illegal wildlife trafficking, looking at the movement of hazardous waste, for example, in and out of South Africa. Um, and then that will obviously, as the Border Management Authority comes online, um, we will begin to have a, a more active relationship with them as well. And then with regard to water, of course, because environment and water are so closely linked, um, and, and I'll talk more again about the mineral resources area as well, um, in terms of the, the close relationship and working operational relationships that we have with those departments. So in terms of the, the, the designation of EMIs, and I'll quickly go through this, it's, it's there in the legislation, but the minister responsible for environment, for water affairs, and for mineral resources can designate EMIs, basically. With, within mineral resources, they are called something different. They're called the Environmental Mineral Resource Inspectors, but they have the same powers as we have as EMIs. And then, of course, the MEC designates at a provincial level. Um, you can obviously delegate that power. And so, for example, within Sand Parks, for instance, you would have EMIs there, and that would be designated by the Sand Parks Board. The functions of EMIs are very much focused on, as I said, monitoring compliance and enforcing compliance with specific pieces of national legislation. Um, and that includes the, the regulations and the norms and standards, et cetera, that would fall under those regulations. Um, we would then also have the powers to investigate any act or omission. And when it comes to investigation, we do talk more about criminal investigation. And there obviously has to be a reasonable suspicion that there has been a breach of the legislation for that to come. Um, and then there's strict admission. We have a national EMI training program, both at a basic level and at a, a more advanced level for specific topics. And for, for officials to come onto that training, it is quite critical that 50% of their key performance area must be dedicated to compliance and enforcement. And, and that training is very much aimed at equipping them to be designated and to do the job that they need to do. Um, this is just to show you quickly the regulatory cycle. Obviously, from the top, we're talking about um, what you would do as a committee and where you would be involved in drafting legislation, looking at policy, et cetera. Um, it then moves across into the permitting type of function. Um, what a, a lot of the line functions within our departments would do in terms of doing compliance permission ensuring that the regulated community understands what they need to comply with. And then our functions as EMIs then come through into the compliance monitoring and into the enforcement. And then that regulatory cycle needs to go back into the cycle. So we then feed back into whether legislation needs to be changed, whether policy needs to be changed. So moving on then in terms of our mandate, and, and it is quite important to understand that certain EMIs that are sitting within certain institutions 
have um, a jurisdiction based on who designates them. So, for example, if you have Sandparks board designating the officials within Sandparks, they would only have their powers within the national parks where they operate. Um, however, there are some non-DEF officials who do have a national designation as an EMI. So you might, for example, still within sand parks have certain EMIs that carry out investigations outside of the parks, and they would then um, be designated by our minister or our DG, um, and they would then be able to operate across the country because they investigate criminal syndicates, etc., and it's important for them to have that designation. So our legal mandate, um, we obviously, as I said, the powers to monitor um, compliance and enforce, and it cuts across all of the, the NEMA and the SEMAs. Um, in terms of the current NEMLA amendment bill that had gone through this committee already, as, as far as I understand, we are also expanding that. So what we are saying is that when MEC designates those provincial EMIs to do compliance and enforcement to national legislation, they will also, once the amendment goes through, be able to execute their functions in respect of a provincial act that substantively deals with environmental management. So again, the aim is to ensure this consistency so that you as an EMI um, working, for example, in the Western Cape, you don't have to think, okay, today I'm doing um, national legislation compliance and enforcement, I must put on my EMI cap, and tomorrow I need to put on my provincial enforcement officer cap, and I have two different powers related to those two different designations. So the idea is to really bring that together. Um, and then it's important to understand that compliance and enforcement is an executive power. And so we have to look at issues around concurrent competency. We have to look at schedules four and five of the constitution. And therefore, even though you might have an EMI sitting within a certain institution, they may only have a mandate linked to what they're able to do, and it may not be a broader mandate. So specifically, if you look at air pollution, for instance, which is um, stated as a local authority date, um, one needs to understand what is the provincial EMI able to do, what is the national EMI able to do within in those situations. So there is quite a lot of overlapping mandates, and I think that sometimes when we you know, get complaints in through the environmental crime hotline, we have a referral protocol that allows us to look at the protocol and say this type of complaint needs to be referred to, for example, water and sanitation, or to mineral and petroleum resources, or agriculture, or health, depending on what the nature of that complaint is. But again, there could be horizontal overlaps, and there could also be vertical overlaps. So, um, you know, we do have SOPs and we do have systems but there may be instances when a national EMI would come on board and, and support a province or even lead the investigation, depending on what the, the contravention is. Uh, the powers, um, they're found there in sections 31A to section 34H of NEMA. Um, you know, it's the normal powers you would expect to have in terms of trying to do monitoring and enforcement. And then in addition to NEMA, there are certain grades of EMIs, and I'll talk to those grades, that also have powers um, from the Criminal Procedure Act. And those are focused more on your search and seizure powers, your powers to arrest, and even powers around roadblocks in terms of Section 138 of the SAPS Act. Um, so those are your typical enforcement or in your investigation powers. And then you have other powers such as inspection powers, and then you have others such as administrative enforcement powers. And again, I'll talk to those in a little bit more detail, but, but those are the, the, the nature of the powers that we generally have. I spoke very quickly about a grading system and, and within our EMI regulations, um, we do set out different grades of EMIs. And that is not about, you know, the importance of an EMI, but it's really focused in on what types of powers do you need in order to do your job. So, for example, we talk to grade five EMIs, which are your, typically your field rangers in your national and provincial parks, and they would have very specific powers that field rangers need under that grading of EMI. So, ability to arrest, to track, to monitor, to seize, etc. Um, and then you'll see from a, a grade four and a grade three EMI is more an, uh, an inspection or a compliance monitoring type of EMI moving into your grade two in, um, investigator EMI that would have all of those powers 
around the Criminal Procedure Act, and then your grade one EMI that would have all the powers that an EMI needs in addition to being able to sign notices, compliance notices. And again, I will talk to that in a few minutes. Um, I did talk a little bit about the peace officer and the nature of the powers. So in NEMA, in addition to obviously having the powers that are set out in NEMA, um, we are all as EMIs um, seen as peace officers, and therefore we can exercise those powers that I spoke about in the Criminal Procedure Act. And, and that is quite critical in terms of some of the work that we need to do around our criminal investigations. Um, our duties, there's a, there's a whole span of um, things within Chapter 7 um, where we have identification cards. It's critical in terms of the Constitution to identify yourselves as EMIs when you walk onto the site. You need to also minimize any damage or loss um, when you're busy doing your work. Um, you need to obviously um, go through certain procedures when you seize items. Um, there's a lot of advanced training, et cetera, that we do with our officials to make sure that they comply with those. There's issues around confidentiality, um, where you are obviously being exposed to quite a lot of sensitive information in the work that you do, and that there's certain um, information that you cannot disclose. Um, and then we also have an EMI code of conduct that applies to EMIs across all the different institutions. And again, we are um, um, making that a, a, a stronger thing within the, the name La Bill that is going through to make that code of conduct legally binding. At the moment, it's more a guideline. Um, I spoke to administrative force enforcement. In addition to the criminal type of enforcement we have, um, the inspectorate actually spends quite a lot of time doing administrative enforcement. And, and this is not about punishing um, those people who are contravening, which is what criminal enforcement is, but it's more about bringing um, those um, sectors and those non-complying entities into compliance. It's about ensuring that um, the environment is remediated, that people apply for authorizations, they stop doing what they're doing because it's causing damage. Um, and, and the way in which we do this type of enforcement is usually through notices or directives telling um, those people who are not complying to do what they need to do. Um, and there is often conditions in those directives. Um, it is also of a lower standard in terms of needing to prove the contravention. And so if you have a reasonable belief that somebody is doing something, you can issue them with a notice. Whereas when you are busy with a criminal process, and if you're wanting to get a conviction in a criminal case, you need to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt um, that they have contravened the law. And so often in certain instances, we may prefer to go the administrative enforcement route to quickly deal with, with harm that is being caused. Um, the, the, this next slide just shows you some of the administrative enforcement notices as EMIs the power to actually issue compliance notices given to an EMI, whereas a lot of these other administrative tools, the power may not necessarily be given to an EMI, but they are also compliance and enforcement related directives. And so within our different entities, we try and ensure that a lot of this enforcement action is done centrally by the compliance and enforcement units. And they're the ones that would then, depending on the contravention you're looking at, depending on which legislation you're dealing with, um, we have a whole procedure around which sort of notice would be used in certain instances. And of course, the last bullet on the slide Obviously, if there's really significant non-compliance going on, there's also mechanisms within all the legislation that you heard about where you can suspend or withdraw licenses that may have already been issued to, to um, facilities. Um, this just gives you a bit of an overview. Um, a compliance notice really is um, about um, taking people on in terms of their non-compliance and issuing notices to bring them back into compliance. And then the other very commonly used one is in section 28.4 of NEMA, which really helps us to deal with the um, activities that are causing serious harm to the environment or significant pollution. You would see quite a lot of those types of directives that are used. Criminal enforcement. Um, currently, the, most of our, our environmental acts actually say that any non-compliance is a criminal offence. So, a lot of our legislation currently heavily relies on the criminal sanction or on the fact that there is a criminal offence 
linked to a non-compliance. Um, so currently we are actually going through a process to look at whether that makes sense and, and whether we should be looking at certain non-compliances attracting rather administrative penalties and some of them obviously still attracting criminal penalties because at the moment we feel that there's too much of uh, emphasis on the criminal system which means we have to rely on a very packed problematic criminal justice system at the moment and so perhaps at some point we could also come back to the committee and and give you a sense of um you know what where that project is because it's quite interesting um you know the outcomes that are coming there um just to to take note that we also do have specific offenses um directed at ensuring that we as emis can do our job efficiently and so there's additional offenses within NEMA looking at hindering or interfering with our work pretending to be an emi or furnishing false or misleading information we also within section 34 of NEMA, which is quite important when we get to um, criminal cases, is that there's an expanded approach to penalties. So even after you've been found guilty in a criminal case and you have to pay a fine or you get a term of imprisonment, there's additional orders that a court can do around, for example, ordering that the damage to the environment be repaired, um, costs of the damage um, in re rehabilitating the environment be paid, the reasonable expenses that we incurred as investigators or prosecutors. And then, of course, there's the normal forfeiture, cancellation, withdrawal type orders um, that, that would come. And the court, even through a criminal case, can withdraw a permit for a period of time as well. So just to, to touch very briefly on the, the compliance and enforcement relative to the one environmental system, and I know that this issue comes up um, quite a lot in terms of where we're dealing specifically with mining related matters. And, and you would know that in December 2014, the one environmental system came into effect where um, the ministers adopted the integrated pr approach around mine environmental management. Um, so the agreement was that as the uh, Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy issues those EIA authorizations, um, that they are also the competent authority to do compliance and enforcement. And I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, those officials within DMRE are called Environmental Mineral Resource Inspectors, and they have the same powers and functions as, as the EMIs do within NEMA. Um, and therefore they are responsible for, for doing the work around that illegal mining. Um, and then obviously all the conditions and the permits and authorizations linked to mining and, and prospecting. Um, there is a mechanism within NEMA called Section 31D, which does enable the EMIs to support the EMRIs, but there is a very specific process that needs to be followed. So if a complainant, for example, is not comfortable that the EMRIs are dealing with issues um, in the way that they should, and um, they can raise that with our minister. And currently within the legislation, once our minister gets concurrence from the, the DMRE minister, then the EMIs can, can support um, the, the, the EMRIs. And this specific issue came out very specifically in the mineral sands resources matter where um, this exact um, issue was, was dealt with in the Western Cape High Court. Um, there we had actually um, planned to do a joint um, execution of a search and seizure warrant. Um, and in fact, we were with the, the DMRE officials as well. But unfortunately, they pulled out at the last minute and therefore we executed that warrant without the, the, the mineral resource officials with us. And this matter specifically went to court. And you can see there that the, the judge found that the exclusive legal mandate of DMR or the EMRIs is there in relation to listed activities directly related to mining. So where, for example, we also deal, for example, within that coastal environment, the Integrated Coastal Management Act, we as EMIs can come in and do our work around that but we can't do it around what's happening from a mining perspective and an environmental authorization perspective. Um, so we have had several complaints and they do keep coming in and we are trying to work together with the, the EMRIs from, from DMRE. Just in terms of um, 
giving you a bit of a sense of the work of the EMIs. Again, as I said, we do issue an annual report every year, and this slide just gives you a bit of a sense of um, you know, which institutions um, their highlights are coming out of, who's done the most inspections, um, where did we get the highest kind of sentences through criminal cases, um, you know, where were the, the kind of highlights, and then also the statistics. Obviously, it's, it is quite a job to get the reporting through um, from all of the EMI institutions, but we do consolidate that on an annual basis. And this gives you a sense of, of the number of arrests, et cetera, across all of those EMI um, entities, as well as the number of notices, fines, et cetera. Um, and those are the inspection statistics as well. I think it is also important just to, to understand that a lot of the work and, and the strategic work that we're currently doing as the inspectorate is in line with what we call our national compliance and enforcement strategy, which was um, launched in 2014. Um, and there's certain um, work, including that administrative penalty project that I spoke about that is happening as a result of the actions um, that we're implementing the strategy. And we are currently reviewing how effective we've been in implementing that strategy and developing a new um, strategy for the next five years. Um, so just to, to finalize um, with a case study, just to give you a bit of a sense of um, some of the work that has happened, and I just thought it was an interesting case um, specifically for um, the Portfolio Committee and that it was looking at the construction of the Pan-African Parliament in Midrand Gauteng. And in this case, it was specifically linked to the EIA legislation. And so um, the DPW at the time had appointed an environmental assessment practitioner to do the EIA process. Um, they had unfortunately given false and misleading information through to our department at the time. Um, based on that false and misleading information, we had then issued an environmental authorization to build the Pan-African Parliament. And as soon as they started building, um, it was realized that the building was right in the middle of um, a hill slope wetland. Um, and therefore, through the enforcement action, both administrative and criminal action that we actually took against the practitioner for giving that false and misleading information, um, we, we halted um, that development. But um, I think that the reason I also wanted to just touch on it was to, to talk a little bit about some of the questions that had come up um, over the last couple of days. And, and that is around um, how do we make decisions in terms of whether to take administrative enforcement action um, when do we take criminal action? How do we deal, for example, with non-complying municipalities? So just to, to give the committee a sense, within our EMI operating manual, we have what we call an enforcement guideline. And that really assists us as the EMI institutions to say, in relation to this contravention, what is it that we should be doing? Should we be taking administrative action or should we be taking criminal enforcement action? So there are very spe specific guidelines about when to initiate a criminal process. And also when it comes to organs of state that are not complying, there is a standard operating procedure for non-compliant organs of state. So for example, with municipalities. Um, and we would then follow that process. The first step in that is to issue them with what we call a pre-compliance notice. Um, which would put them on terms, it would make them respond to us in terms of what they're going to do to address the issues. If we're not comfortable with that, we would elevate it up to the municipal manager. If we're not happy with that, then it would move into a, a compliance notice process. And if they then continue not to comply with that notice, then it would move over into a criminal process with specifically. But I think it is important to understand that a lot of the work around non-compliant municipalities is undertaken by the provincial EMIs because, for example, general landfill sites fall within their um, mandate and therefore they would need to, to deal with that. A lot of the sewage issues, for instance, um, would, be, would fall within the Department of Water and Sanitation's mandate and therefore they would initially deal with those matters. Um, it may be elevated to the deaf EMIs at a later stage, either through um, if complainants, for example, open criminal dockets at the police station in line with our SOP with the police, 
those dockets would then be handed over to Asset National to deal with those dockets. So, so there are various protocols um, that are in place to deal with those issues. Um, I think I can probably then just deal with the issue around environmental courts um, or green courts. I think there was a question that came up over the last couple of days around that. Um, we, we had a, a very formal process back in 2010 um, with the Department of Justice, with the NPA and all the other role players to really have a look at, at whether it would make sense to have a court similar to the one that had been in Hermanus. And we, we had a number of workshops. We, we looked at the number of cases specifically um, that were coming out at the time in 2010. And basically the, the result or the conclusion of that process is that it did not make sense at that time to have specific dedicated courts for environmental issues. Um, the NPA at that time felt they had adequate prosecutorial services and that there were very complex logistics in place. If you wanted to have a specific court in a specific geographic area, that the, the Department of Justice was not in support of having these dedicated courts. So instead of doing that at the time, we obviously had a, a, a bit of a multi-pronged approach. Um, you know, we have a, a program around awareness that we do with the South African Judicial Education Institute. We have a training program with the prosecutors, both at a basic and a specialized level. Um, and, and some of what we have done have resulted in fairly good sentences, particularly, for example, around rhino poaching, etc. But I think it may be time to relook at this issue. Um, we do have a couple of other initiatives underway. Um, so we've spoken about the administrative penalty project. Um, we've also got certain projects under GF7 and our wildlife trafficking projects where we are also going to strengthen the capabilities of the prosecutors. And then we're also going to do a research project that will really look at, you know, does it make sense to, to have a court again that is just dedicated to these issues. So, so there are a couple of um, initiatives underway that will start to look at whether now in 2020 does it make sense to try and, and have that in place. Um, there were also, Chair, maybe if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, there seem to be some questions around air quality and, um, you know, whether we are doing work to deal with air quality issues as EMIs, um, and whether we're shutting down certain um, facilities. Uh, perhaps just to give you an indication that at a, at a national level, from DEF side, we have a number of enforcement actions, compliance notices out against ESCOM Tutuka, Camden and Kendall. There have been certain units shut down at, Kem, um, at Kendall. Um, Lataba is also um, a subject of a pre-compliance notice. Um, we obviously had certain um, work that we did at AMSA Funder Bale. Um, so there will be strategic facilities. Um, SASOL is another one where, as the National Department, we do get involved in the enforcement processes. And then within the VAL priority area, we have spent quite a lot of time um, in phase one of a, a particular project where we capacitate the local authorities, um, four of them within Gauteng and one in Free State, where we um, targeted about 14 facilities, and then we'll do follow-up in phase two. Um, we've also spent quite a bit of time looking at what equipment do we need in order to do our compliance and enforcement air quality work, and, and spent a fair amount of, of money and, f and, and money specifically from fines that have been paid over to us to place monitors at certain hotspot areas um, at, next to hazardous landfill sites. Um, and also to purchase equipment to allow us to do the, the, the in-stack monitoring that needs to be done so we don't have to rely on those facilities to tell us what, what is coming out of their stack. So maybe that's just a brief explanation and perhaps we can pr provide um, a little bit more information in terms of um, specific cases and, and things that we have dealt with. So I, I know you're pressed for time this evening, um, so let me leave it there for now. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, Honourable members, any questions? Lorimer, please, Mr. Chair. Uh, you are number one. Number two, Paulson, okay. Number two, Honourable Paulson. 
Who? Love is coffee. Okay. Can we start Honorable Lorima? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, look, I just want to clarify um, the situation with regard to mining. Do I have it correct that the EMIs can't act against the mine with the EMRIs without their cooperation? So in other words, you need the cooperation of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy before you act against a mine. Because I've found that practically enforcement of uh, against people breaking environmental legislations while legislation while mining is almost completely ineffective. Um, as examples, I can point to the Brockfontein mine, which is the Gupta coal mine. Uh, and more recently, uh, my con colleague, Honorable Weber, um, with uh, the mine on the borders of um, Optimum, which appears to be operating completely ineffectively and has been allowed to do so for months and months. So and this, this is just clearly not working. So it, I'd like your comment on that, please, and just clarification as to whether I've got it correct. The next one is really more of a comment than, uh, than a question. But this decision to close the green courts, which were um, being used against uh, abalone poachers in the Western Cape, I think was completely wrong. And I find that justification really weak because people close to the issue tell me that that was the one time that there was act actually effective action against abalone poaching. So I wonder whether you can, perhaps the question to that is, is can you give us any kind of indication as to whether you think these courts will start operating again? And if so, when is that likely? Thank you. Okay, number two. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Craigie. Uh, I'd like to know what has been the success or the effectiveness of the EMIs in bringing people to book? Uh, that's the one question. And the other one is, when you recruit these EMIs, let's say, for example, near a game reserve, sand parks, to what extent do you do you to try and get people from the nearby communities or applicants from the nearby communities involved in in these type of roles, which would actually assist in in creating awareness and respect for the the uh, for the environment or, or whichever uh, whether it's a game reserve or a national park. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Honorable uh, Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I will, I will uh, cover the, uh, some aspects of the things that I want to know. Uh, I also want to know the role of the EMIs in mining. And my question here is if the mining inspectors have to have the cooperation of other departments, um, and we know that it's very, very ineffective. And in the NCOP, uh, in the past term, we we did a lot of oversight where we discovered a lot of problems that was just not solvable. The process of reviewing the various uh, legislation at this stage, why are we not addressing that issue via the legislation? This is the one question. The other one is, um, I would like to know what level of um, EMIs do we have in the coastal areas um, and various municipalities and what is their authority in the areas where we know that is known for poaching? Uh, because I think, or from what I've heard, uh, that we have the same problem. The EMIs, the, the inspectors, in a way, of, uh, of their hands are tied uh, up to a certain point. Um, and what is the, that is one on the one hand side, on the other hand, uh, on the other side, avalanche poaching um, in a protected area is, is illegal because it's um, in a protected area. But there's no quotas or anything, or avalanche is not um, listed as a protected species. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of opinions around this. Um, if you list it, it will become even worse. If you and but as it is, 
it is a big problem. So what is the who, whose focus should this be? Should it be the the this department uh, uh, of environment or is this solely a focus for SEPs? Thank you. Thank okay. You. Yes. Okay. Can I ask questions, please? Please. Yes. All right. I think it's page four. The current EMI capacity local municipalities four hundred and seven. I would like to know. I will just mention Pumalanga. The um, presenter spoke about specifically air pollution here. We have 17 municipalities, so you say you have 16 EMIs. But when we look at air pollution, our local municipalities, municipalities give that authority to our district municipalities. So there is no EMI for, for, for uh, air pollution at the local municipalities. And I want to know if you know this. And then we have three districts, and which is 16 or 17 municipalities for, and I've been at them, and um, it's a big struggle to get hold of these EMI. So I'm not sure how functional are they. If you can help me regarding this, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Can we get responses? Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm, go I'm going to try and, and deal with um, most of the issues, but. Um, my my normal boss, um, which is the, actually the acting DG, I'm sure he may, he may want to come in as well. Um, but but maybe just to start from the beginning, yes, um, you are correct. As EMIs, we really do have a major challenge in terms of dealing with mining. So from December 2014, when the One Environmental System came in, it basically meant that EMIs could not necessarily deal with issues within mining areas and that that was the exclusive jurisdiction of DMRE. Um, what, what the previous chair at that time of this committee did was he then inserted that section 31D that I spoke about, where it was almost allowing a back door to remain open to allow for EMIs to help the EMRIs um, when it came to mining issues. But as I said earlier, the difficulty there is that it's quite a cumbersome process for a complainant to actually get the EMIs involved. And there needs to be this process where the minister of DMRE basically gives his concurrence before our minister can ask us as EMIs to go and assist. In terms of the, the latest NEMLA bill, um, we have proposed to change that concurrence to after consultation, to water it down a little bit, to say, um, you know, we don't now need the permission, but our, after our minister has written the letter to say she's not happy, we can then get involved because that, that would amount to consultation rather than concurrence. So it, it is a, an issue and obviously a lot of complaints come in around the mining issues and yes, as EMIs, we, we are not able to get involved until the 31D process has played out. Um, with, with regard to the Hermanus court, and, and I know it's quite some time ago when that court was operating, um, I don't know that we're going to be able to get courts in the near future. As I said, we've got certain initiatives and processes underway that I'm really hoping that the recommendations that would come out at the end of those processes is that we need to, to set up certain environmental courts in certain areas. Um, I think the problem is what one of the, um, you might be aware of the National Integrated Strategy to Combat Wildlife Trafficking, which is a strategy that has just now gone up through the JCPS cluster um, and it should be going to cabinet quite soon, as far as I understand. And, and that is to really look at the wildlife trafficking in, in rhino, um, abalone, cycads, and, and then elephants is also included in that. And that strategy then does start to talk about, I don't want to say dedication, but the Department of Justice will be kind of put on terms to say, how are we going to deal with these trafficking issues from a, from a judicial perspective? And if it's not about dedicated courts, how do we at least increase the capacity within the existing courts to be able to focus some of their time 
um, on these issues. And so I think that once that strategy gets adopted at a cabinet level, it will make it easier to put pressure then on these different departments to, to look at this. Um, the success in, in bringing people to book, um, you know, I think if you have a look, and I suppose when you talk about bringing people to book, it's important to understand what we mean. If we are fairly good at bringing people, you know, they not complying and we need to bring them back into compliance. If, if you have a look at the number of pre-compliance notices we issue compared to the number of compliance notices we issue, you will see that we do, we are quite good at getting people at a pre-compliance stage to do what they're supposed to do so that we don't need to go and issue a final notice to them. But if you have a look at some of the bigger pollution issues, um, so it might be re related to sewage and those types of things, I think we've got quite a lot of work still to do. And, and I'm afraid that at this point, quite a lot of that has kind of gotten to a level now where we really need to be bringing more criminal cases against specific people um, to start addressing those issues. So while we have had some success um, around some of the bigger companies, um, we do have a couple of cases that are currently kind of on court rolls against municipalities for this exact issue. And we're just waiting for one of those cases to really have a good success, set a precedent that would then allow some of our other cases to really get through the courts. Um, when we look at abalone poaching, it is a difficult thing. Um, you know, I, I'm very involved in what we call Initiative 5 of Pakisa, where we have the integrated and coordinated compliance enforcement program under Pakisa, where um, we come in and we try and assist and support the local um, enforcement people in certain areas um, to deal with, with abalone poaching. I think the difficulty is that the EMIs, if we're speaking specifically about powers of EMIs, um, they don't have the power to um, enforce the Marine Living Resources Act um, unless they're designated as fishery control officers. So they do have the power within the MPAs, and we have recently started looking, for example, specifically at Robben Island, um, where a lot of poachers have been arrested and starting to charge them properly in terms of the MPA regulations, rather than in terms of what the police have been doing. And so there's, there's a couple of issues that we are trying to really get right, um, so that we can at least support the police in terms of what they're, they're doing. Um, and then the local authority EMIs within um, Mpumalanga, I know we do have some real challenges there. What we can do is provide you, particularly with the provincial EMIs that are supposed to be there to support the local authority EMIs. Um, but we do realize there are challenges around um, the capacity of the local authority EMIs and whether they're really focusing in on the priorities that they need to be focusing in. And we, ha we have a specific project for this year um, to really look at the capacity that is sitting there and whether they're doing what they should be doing. Uh, so thank you. Um, I hope I covered all the questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, I think we, we have, if we have not, we'll <clears throat> uh, find some other time. Can we still squeeze another presentation? Yes, Jay, we can. I think you said we are available until nine o'clock tonight. Yes, let's try. Uh, uh, who, who is coming next now? Um, yeah. Jay, it will be our first three colleagues up earlier. Okay. Who is coming in?
apologies for this chair. It seems like there's a bit of confusion. Um, up yeah. next is the uh, Marine Living Resources Act, um, and that's going to be uh, Mr. Sasa Pihai, if they can uh, with regard to the MLRA, please. Thanks, uh, Acting DG, and good evening, Chairperson, and honorable members and colleagues. Uh, can I just, Chairperson, get a confirmation that you are able to see my presentation on the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks uh, very much. Uh, Chairperson, my name is Sasa Pieha, as the DG acting has introduced me. I'm the director responsible for the management of uh, offshore and high seas fisheries. And based on the brief for, for the workshop, I'll be taking you through the Marine Living Resources Act. And Chair, my presentation will cover the overview of the Act. We'll look at uh, relevant sections that I have identified that might be uh, of interest and worth being aware of by uh, the members of the committee. And then out of that, I'll also touch on the three uh, subordinate uh, legislations that emanates from the Act. And during my presentation, Chair, I will touch on uh, various primary regulatory mechanisms, areas where we also cooperate with other uh, governing structures. And then I'll a little bit touch on the implementation and the challenges that we go through in, in, in implementing uh, the act. Uh, Chair, on the screen, I've projected the, the purpose of the Act. I'm not going to, to read it to you. Uh, I'm just going to indicate to you that, Chair, uh, the Act is a very old Act that was promulgated in 1998 and has never undergone any socioeconomic impact assessment like a lot of uh, recently promulgated uh, Acts. Uh, although uh, the Act was slightly amended, Chairperson, on three occasions in the year 2000, in 2003, as well as in 2014. In my presentation, Chair, uh, I will speak to those areas that have been amended, as one of them uh, is very critical and speaks to the recognition of the small scale fishers. Chair, uh, the Act as it stands regulate marine fisheries and marine aquaculture. Although it is important to bring to your attention that there's a process that's currently underway to develop a separate uh, aquaculture legislation. And the primary purpose of the Act is to ensure sustainable allocation of rights, permits, and licenses to different fishing sectors and to achieve optimal utilization and ecologically sustainable uh, development. It further promotes uh, economic growth, uh, restructuring of the fishing industry in order to address the historical imbalances of the past and to attempt to achieve equity within uh, all branch of uh, fishing. And most importantly, it also adopts a precautionary approach in the management of uh, living resources, as well as protecting the entire uh, marine ecosystem. Chair, uh, the jurisdiction of the Act. The slides are not going with the presentation. Yes, I was just still giving the, the preamble, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. Uh, Chair, the, the, the jurisdiction of the Act applies to all South African persons, vessels, 
and aircrafts operating over South African waters, and also the entire ex economic exclusive zone and up to 200 nautical miles offshore. And uh, Chair, it also covers uh, waters around the Prince Edward Islands, and that is the area surrounding Marion Island and Prince Edward Islands that are South African jurisdictions. And most importantly, it also uh, covers all the South African vessels that are operating in the high seas. As it stands, Chair, the Act contains eight chapters, with the first part, like most, uh, if not all, acts being the definitions, uh, which are of critical importance when implementing the Act. And because of any slight misinterpretation that might occur, it might also easily result in non-compliance. Out of the eight chapters, Chair, I've uh, carefully selected uh, specific areas, which I will take you through them. As I've indicated, that uh, uh, I think are of 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 relevance. But uh, I think we'll start with the 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 the, the, the definitions, Chair. Uh, the two important definitions, Chair, that I think uh, I need to bring to your attention is the definition of fish processing establishment. That is, uh, as it stands, uh, it's very confusing because uh, it's very broad and covers any vehicles, vessels, premises, or places that uh, produce any products from, from fish. This includes cutting up and freezing and chilling and icing of of free of uh, fish. And unfortunately, it if if it's implemented as is, uh, it includes a whole lot of all retail stores as well as your private homes. So in this particular regard, chair, an exemption has been granted in this regard to cover uh, the commercial places that receives fish directly from the right holders and other premises that uh, handles fish requires to at least have a receipt as proof of the source of their their fish the the, the second definition chair that has also been very uh, unclear is the definition of a small scale fisher Chair will remember that I, I indicated that the act was uh, amended twice. I mean, three times. Uh, one of the amendments that were done in 2014 was the definition of a subsistence fisher in the act that was uh, that was removed, and the process of amending that act. Chair, it was a very intensive uh, consultative process in preparation for uh, the rollout of the small scale uh, fishing uh, sector. So the, 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 the definition was removed because of its lack of inclusivity and it was replaced by the definition of a small scale fisher. And uh, all other areas in the Act, like Section 18, that talk to subsistence fisher, they were all changed to small-scale fisher. And this amendment, Chair, if you look at the old definition of a subsistence fisher, it did not allow the subsistence fishers to, to, to trade, sell, or butter their their catch. So it was expanded from subsistence to small scale fisher. Uh, Chair will remember that recently there's been a number of challenges, particularly during lockdown, uh, with a group of fishermen in the KwaZulu Natal that have named themselves subsistence fishers. And they were very vocal during uh, alert level five and four when they were not allowed to fish because they were not part of the small scale fishing uh, uh, cooperatives that have been identified in the KwaZulu Natal 
uh, area. And as such, when we said the small scale fishers can proceed with fishing, they were left out because they are currently operating on recreational fishing permits as the act uh, recognizes three forms of fishing. It's a uh, commercial fishing, recreational fishing, and small scale uh, fishing. And as such, uh, the very same group was consulted uh, in and around 2012 when we were working on small scale and amending the act. And some of them, we know them personally, and initially they were very clear that they are not interested in being part of small scale because uh, they did not want to be regulated. Even at, at the moment, they are fishing with recreational fishing permits, and they still continue to illegally sell uh, their catches. Although there are processes that are in place to accommodate them so that they can properly form part of a small scale fishing cooperatives and they can be able to catch an array of species that they can sell or use for personal, for personal use. I'll, I'll explain that when I get to small scale down in the, in the presentation. Uh, Chair, initially when I introduced the purpose of the act, I also touched on uh, the objectives uh, of the Marine Living Resources Act. The act has 10 objectives, and I'll only just focus on five. That covers a uh, bulk of the branch's work, although I must highlight that uh, the five that I'm highlighting on the screen, Chair, do not necessarily supersede uh, other objectives that are are reflected in section two of, of the act. I've indicated that it talks to uh, the need to achieve optimal utilization and economical uh, use of the resources, also to ensure conservation for present and future generations, and also to utilize uh, the resources to achieve economic growth. This is where the issues of uh, rights allocations comes into into play and also creation of uh, jobs. And then importantly also when uh, resources are being harvested, there's also a need to protect the entire ecosystem as a whole, talking to uh, the issues of bycatch, how do we manage bycatch when we are managing uh, directed catch? Those are the species that are not necessarily really intended to be caught, but they form part of the catch. And Chair, the most important one also is uh, the need to restructure the fishing industry. I, I've spoken about it uh, uh, earlier. Chair, the next uh, chapter is chapter two, which talks to uh, the administration. Of key importance under chapter two, Chair, what I've picked up is uh, section five to section seven which talks of uh, forums, uh, the establishment of the consultative advisory forum for the marine living resources. Uh, this forum chair needs to be uh, broadly representative and multidisciplinary. Its purpose is to advise the minister on any matter that the minister would have referred to it and the issues that they should advise the minister on are not limited uh, to the development of the fishing industry only, and also can advise on issues relating to, to research. The, the last forum that was uh, established, it was uh, disbanded in 2003 by the then minister, uh, Vali Musa. Uh, recently, uh, the minister attempted again last year to reconstitute a new forum, but there were disruptions in terms of changes in administration and the process uh, was abandoned and restarted again uh, recently. Uh, just before lo uh, lockdown, there was a, a call for, for nominations for consideration to be uh, appointed to be part of the forum. The next part, Chair, is Section 8, which speaks to the recognition of industrial bodies and interested groups. This outlines the formal recognition of industry associations, 
that are representatives of various uh, subgroups within the fishing sector. Chair would be aware and members that uh, there are a number of fishing associations that are currently existing in the commercial sector, uh, as well as in the small scale uh, fishing sector that have been recognized in terms of section eight of the act, just to list one or two colleagues will be aware uh, of the South African Deep Sea Trolling Industry Association, known as SATSTIA. Uh, there is also the South East Coast Inshore Fisheries Association, and also some of the associations recognized operates in the small scale fishing sector, like the South African United Fishing Front. I think we have a very famous friend uh, by the name of Pedro Gracia leading that uh, association. Uh, chapter 9, Chair, which is the next part, talks to the powers of the minister to appoint a fisheries control officer or honorary marine conservation officers. Uh, chair, this legal prov provision, uh, I think we have not fully exploited it. Uh, with more honorary marine conservation officers appointed, I'm of the view that, uh, Chair, we should be able to have more ears and eyes on the ground. Uh, in the past, Chair, this section we've also used to enter into an MOU with SMVL or KZN Wildlife to assist the department uh, with fisheries compliance in the KwaZulu-Natal. Unfortunately, uh, this MOU has since been terminated in 2016. And because of that termination, it has required that the department deploy uh, additional fisheries compliance officers to the KwaZulu-Natal area, putting more strain on the currently existing uh, capacity within uh, fisheries uh, compliance. Although uh, we have reconsidered, and the department is considering to review the MOU with KZN as in Velo Wildlife. Ch chapter, section 12, uh, it's also a very important section. It talks to the upkeep and the maintenance of the rights registers. Uh, we are required by law to keep registers of all rights uh, granted by the minister in terms of the act, a register of all permits and licenses, and we're supposed to make them available to any person who requests them uh, in a format or a manner that is prescribed in, uh, in the regulation. So at any particular point in time, if anyone wants to know the right register and right holders can easily approach the department and that information will be made in terms of uh, this section. And a very critical important section chair, it's section 13 that talks to uh, permits uh, which will be your general uh, catch permits, import permits, and export uh, permits. This section prohibits any person who, does, who has not been granted the right to harvest fish without being issued with the catch permit. And this catch permits chair by law are issued for a period that does not exceed a year. And each uh, permit that is issued comes very, with very clear permit conditions that are consulted annually with the right holders in the respective uh, fishing sectors. The permits and the permit conditions chair are supposed to be retained at a place where the right is exercised so that uh, when fisheries compliance officers do an inspection, uh, each person can be able to uh, provide the permits that uh, they are using to harvest. And failure to do so uh, would be considered to, to be fishing illegally or, or, or poaching. And then uh, lastly, Chair, the section also make provision that any person that is holding a permit that did not comply with the permit conditions of the previous season uh, the department should refuse uh, to issue them with a permit for the next uh, following season. And bulk of this uh, permits and licenses, the section uh, has been delegated 
to middle managers within the fisheries branch to have the authority to issue those. And uh, Chair, the next part is chapter three, uh, with section 14 talking to determination of allowable catches and applied effort. Uh, this is what we would call a TAC and TAE in short, annually. And this delegation has been granted to uh, the DDG of uh, fisheries. And when the DDG do determinations on an annual basis, uh, she takes into account the split between the three spheres of fishing that I've, I've allocated. In every sector, there's a portion that is put aside for small scale, for recreational fishing, as well as for local commercial uh, fishing. And Chair should also note that these TACs and TAEs, total applied effort and total applied catch, uh, they are determined scientifically. And if the scientific uh, models indicate that uh, the stock status is in good shape, and then uh, the TAC for the following year normally would go up by a certain percentage. Unfortunately, there is no provision that is made for uh, foreign fishing as our policies do not allow uh, for that. Although it is important, Chair, to note that uh, I think currently there are about four foreign flat fishing vessels in the tuna longline sector that are not necessarily foreign fishing, but that are fishing uh, under joint uh, venture agreement. The right, the permits and the licenses uh, belongs to South African entities. Those entities almost in a kind of uh, how we rent vehicles at the airport. They have rented uh, vessels from a Japanese counterpart to assist them in fishing for, for their allocations. And so the next part that I think is also very important, uh, it's section 18, uh, which talks to the allocation of fishing rights, uh, affectionately known as FRAP. Uh, the section clearly uh, prohibits any person to engage in fishing activities without having been granted a right. This is in all uh, three uh, spheres of, of fishing. And we use that uh, act to start the process of rights allocation and be able to allocate rights within various uh, fishing sectors. And part of section 18, uh, has been delegated to the DDG or D Deputy Director General of Fisheries to allow for the determination of the process that uh, leads to the allocations. And then uh, certain parts of uh, Section 18, which is parts that talk specifically to granting of fishing rights. The minister will uh, identify officials within the department that she feels are competent and capable to allocate fishing rights in the specific sectors that will be due for reallocation in the next coming uh, few months. In the past, uh, this section of granting of fishing rights would have generally been uh, delegated to one individual that uh, allocates in all fishing sectors. But I think uh, the, the, the minister wants uh, to involve uh, more than one uh, delegated authority for allocation of rights. And uh, Chair, I think the next, I'll speak on uh, small fishing small scale fishing uh, later chair section 19, and I'll also speak on recreational fishing at that time. The, the, the recreational fishing sector chair, uh, it's mainly uh, all operators that uh, buy and procure their fishing licenses at the post office. They are managed through uh, 
recreational bag limits that are available and are renewed annually, also depending on the availability of uh, fish. And in this sector, Chair, the permit holders are not allowed uh, to sell their catch, and the limits are set on a daily uh, bag limits. And uh, Chair, the next section that I've uh, looked at is section 23, which uh, is a provision to ensure that uh, all vessels that are used for fishing uh, do apply and are issued with a valid local license. A vessel license chair is almost similar to a license of a motor vehicle that has to be renewed annually for the vessel to participate in the fishing sector. As much as the driver has a driver's license in his personal capacity, the motor vehicle as well needs to be licensed. So it is the local fishing uh, license. They are valid for a year. And for vessels to go out and fish, they should have uh, those uh, commercial fishing that allocated to it, a valid permit for that season, and a valid license for that uh, vessel. And as I've indicated in my past, Past interventions, Chair, that all needs to be on board the vessel. Uh, Section 25, Chair, talks to fees, and this provision, Chair, uh, ensures that all rights, permits, and licenses that are issued in terms of the Act are paid against a fee that has been determined by the Minister in consultation with uh, the Minister of Finance. Part of a uh, the next rights allocations, Chair, we will be doing another consultation on fees to determine as to what should be the application fee in each particular uh, sector that we, we will be allocating. And also to look at uh, what should be for, for levies. Uh, that would be the fees, levies held against that has been lended in terms of uh, weight by by the right holder. And notorious section chair is section 28, uh, which makes provision for rights, licenses, or permits to be cancelled, suspended, or revoked. And this chair happens only when uh, the holder of a right license or a permit provides a uh, information to the department that is not true or complete, for example, in the case of allocation process, or if they have failed to comply with the conditions that have been given to them as part of their licenses or permits, or in any way if they fail to comply with the provisions of the Marine Living Resources Act. And also if they are convicted in a court of law of an offense uh, in terms of the Marine Living Resources Act, then the department uh, will start with the process of uh, Section 28 to afford a, a right holder or a permit license holder to explain as to why should their uh, right uh, not be cancelled or suspended or revoked. It's an Audi Alta Rampate a principle where right holders are given an opportunity, uh, failing which then, uh, depending on the reasons, then the decision will be taken. And also one of the criteria chair to evoke section 28, uh, it's if a right holder has failed to utilize their permit licenses or a right. If you are granted a right and you don't activate it for a period of more than two years, or for a period of more than two years, you don't come to the department to apply for your permit uh, or, or licenses. And then a uh, section 28 process will kick in as to why should you continue to hold a right that you are not fully utilizing. Chair part five, which talks of the transformation uh, council, uh, 
I will not uh, touch much on that one, uh, as well as uh, part six that talks to foreign fishing vessel, as the uh, fishing vessel, foreign fishing vessel is not allowed uh, in South Africa. And then that brings me chair to uh, part seven, which talks to uh, high seas fishing. Section 40 and 41 chair prohibits uh, fishing on the high seas without a permit. A lot of current right holders, they believe that uh, beyond 200 nautical miles, which is high seas, it's free for all. And that is not the case. Any vessel that goes beyond high seas, depending on the resource that they will be targeting, a lot of the resources share in that uh, part of the world are governed or managed by uh, what we call uh, regional fisheries management organizations that regulate resources such as uh, tunas and uh, uh, various uh, forms of fish related to the tuna sector. So a vessel that goes to fish needs to be permitted and also permit conditions granted uh, against that same uh, vessel. In chapter 40, section 42, Chair, I've spoken of regional fisheries uh, organization. This section relates to the implementation of uh, concept Conservation and management. Uh, regional fisheries management organizations, Chair, uh, they, we, we, we as a country, South Africa, we subscribe and are members to uh, some of them. Uh, IOTC for Indian Ocean Tuna Commission and ICAT for International Conservation Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. And annually, uh, chair, this organizations uh, set up regulatory mechanisms uh, to ensure that there is structure in harvesting of uh, ICS resources. And the provision allows us to implement some of those conservation and management measures that uh, shed stocks uh, to implement it into our local permit uh, conditions. And then uh, chapter four talks to marine protected areas. I will not touch on it as uh, my colleagues have uh, spoken about it. And this is part of the amendments that were done through the National Environment Management Act, Protected Areas Act of 2010. Uh, yes, that, I think that is the amendment that colleagues uh, spoke uh, about. And then uh, uh, the next part is chapter five uh, on top of the screen, which uh, talks on various fishing methods that are prohibited. Uh, this method includes the use of explosives, firearms, poisons or any other noxious substances. Uh, Chair, you uh, need to know that in other parts of the world, uh, fishermen go on sea and deploy and explosives and detonate it underwater, damaging various uh, ecosystems in order for them to be able to catch fish. Those kind of uh, fishing methods are prohibited uh, in South Africa and as such, we discourage fishermen to go to sea with firearms and explosives. As we have had reports of incidences of uh, fishermen shooting seals uh, at sea, those kind of fishing methods are prohibited. There's also a provision to prevent anyone from being in possession of a fishing gear that does not comply with the gear construction of the sector that they are operating in. And most importantly, we spoke of conflict and of uh, marine spatial planning. Uh, in the Act, there's also a, a provision that uh, makes it illegal for fishermen to interfere with the gear of other fishermen at sea, which is a major source of conflict in the, in the fishing sector. 
You have had reports of uh, rock lobster ports being destroyed, lines of uh, other fishing sectors being cut at sea. And in the worst case scenario, there are people that uh, make a living out of uh, harvesting from ports and lines that uh, do not belong to them. Uh, also, the use of uh, fish aggregating devices are not allowed in South Africa because of their destructive nature. Uh, in other areas or parts of the world, they put up various floating objects in the sea that have electronic gadgets such as GPS. And by virtue of an, any object that is floating uh, individually at sea, it makes provision for good shelter for small uh, fish. So they tend to attract a lot of fish. So that form of fishing using aggregating devices uh, is prohibited uh, in, in South Africa. And another section that is also very important is uh, talks to foreign fish vessels and how they should stock when they are passing through South Africa or when they are calling to any of our uh, four designated ports. If a foreign vessel is to call into a any of the four designated ports, that is uh, Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Devon, and Richards Bay, they are required to be issued with a permit to enter South African waters. And in the process of of transit, they're required to store the fishing gear in a manner that uh, is in them. And so it's also important to note that South Africa is uh, part of the UN and we have to comply uh, with the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. That uh, means that chair, if a vessel requests innocent passage through South African waters, uh, the law requires us to allow them to uh, transgress and pass through our waters. And South Africa being South Africa where it is, we are in one of the busiest shipping lanes. So it's not a uh, number of uh, fishing vessels transgressing from uh, the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean, but there's conditions that they must comply with. And here and there, Chair, we admit that there is also an element of mischief, which we always guard against and try to bring to book those that uh, have not complied. And Chair, Section 51 uh, contains powers that are conferred to the fisheries compliance uh, officers, and these powers includes uh, entry with or without uh, a warrant, a search and seizure of vessels, vehicles, or aircraft, and powers to board the vessel, stop fishing and remove fishing gear from uh, the vessels, and also most importantly, uh, to seize and confiscate uh, illegal items and illegal uh, fish. Uh, the next section chair is uh, under chapter eight, which speaks to, which is actually the very last uh, chapter. It talks to the general provisions of the act and section 77 gives the minister the powers to make the regulations regarding any matters uh, required or permitted in terms of the act. Uh, currently, uh, we have three regulations that are in place, and I will touch a little bit on them uh, at the end of the uh, presentation of the Act. Uh, it's the general regulations under the Marine Living Resources Act uh, and the protection of wild abalone regulations, and then the regulations relating to uh, small-scale uh, fishing. Uh, section 78 and 79 chair are almost similar. They talk to the assignment and delegations of powers, uh, with section 78 talking to the assignment of administrative powers to the executive authority of a province, 
and I do not have any records of this provision chair of the act being uh, evoked. And section 79 talks to the delegations of powers in terms of the act. All the various sections that uh, chair have spoken about. Uh, through section 29, the minister delegates them to various uh, individuals, officials within uh, within the, 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 the department. Uh, section 80 is a very important section. Uh, it talks to appeals, particularly for the aggrieved persons. Any person that uh, is affected by a decision that has been taken by a delegated person in terms of the Marine Living Resources Act, then uh, may appeal to the minister. And uh, uh, the appellant when they have to provide the minister with the reasons and the person or the delegated have uh, taken that decision. We will also have to provide the reasons that led them taking that uh, decision. Uh, this democratic provision is in line with uh, Section 238 of the South African Constitution as well as the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, also known as the PAJA Act. So that is why after every single rights allocations, all those applicants and individuals that are not happy with the process, uh, we make provision that uh, they can appeal the decisions. Another important section uh, is Section 81 that talks to exemptions. And this section gives the minister uh, powers to exempt uh, individuals or groups or organs of state from any provision of the act. Uh, similarly, with rights that are granted in terms of section 18, exemptions are granted with uh, terms and conditions, and exemption holders are required to apply for licenses and permits once they have been uh, granted uh, exemption. So just to give you an example, uh, this provision of exemptions has been evoked for small-scale fisheries sector, where we have exempted them from uh, fees. Uh, they are not uh, supposed to pay for fees uh, to, in order to apply for their, their permits. And uh, the last section on my presentation chair is section 83, which talks to uh, permitting of scientific investigations and practical experiments. Uh, chair, this function is delegated to the Chief Director of Fisheries Research and Development. Uh, she is the only person that can approve any scientific experiments. And currently, there's a policy that guides uh, the application process for experiments. Unfortunately, uh, Chair, there's been an avalanche of applications, mostly from applicants that intend to circumvent the allocations process. Uh, they know that the sector is operational, uh, for example, post-mackerel, but they will submit applications continuously to be granted uh, experiments to go and harvest the uh, host marker. As such, Chair, uh, a moratorium has been placed on unsolicited applications, and the department is only considering practical experiments on, on invitation. Uh, in implementing this section, Chair, the Chief Director is supported by a panel of uh, various experts, uh, to assist her in considering and evaluating any uh, applications in this regard. The current policy that is used for experiment is also under review. Uh, Chair, I've spoken of the three regulations that uh, emanated from the MLRA. The first one uh, is the general regulations under the MLRA, which provide for uh, the specifics uh, of various types of fishing, for example, including the types of species that may be caught, the type of fishing gear that may be used per 
this kind of fishery. It also prescribes uh, the catch and the size uh, uh, fishing clothes and open seasons in sectors that are not allowed to fish at various times of the world. And it also, also includes chapters that talks to a proclamation of fishing harbors in South Africa. At the moment, we have 12 uh, proclaimed fishing uh, harbors. And uh, uh, part of us, for example, in the regulations, talk to movement of vessels. Uh, vessels are supposed to be slipped and the general provisions uh, of the management of uh, the and at the last part of the sentence, the annex charts that uh, includes a list of species caught by uh, recreational sectors that also find their way into the recreational fishing brochure, as well as a list of prohibited uh, species. And then the next uh, regulation chair is the regulations on. Uh, Abalone. Uh, the regulations chair on abalone designate areas where wild abalone is found, and they also prohibit diving in certain areas as well as uh, to be in possession of prohibited gears in those uh, identified areas with abalone, which is called the dive ban areas. Uh, the regulations obviously provide for the definitions and uh, it lists the uh, prohibited gears that uh, people are not supposed to be in possession of in those areas. This includes your diving masks, snorkels, flippers, artificial breathing equipment and shackles that are used to, to, to dismember the uh, court about chair. The agents, as they stand, they also do acknowledge that there are exceptions, uh, and in these exceptions, uh, they make provision for applications to be made to, for to be exempted to operate in a, a bent area, particularly for scientific research or cage diving or commercial kelp harvesting, salvage operations and just general maintenance of uh, underwater infrastructure in those, in those areas. The last regulations, which is the third one, is the regulations for uh, relating to small scale fishing. Uh, the regulations share uh, our recent regulation followed the promulgation of this and and clearly set out the time frame, the application process. They further define a uh, criteria for an individual to be determined as a small scale fisher or a community to be defined as a sideline to what communities need to do or to managing their right once a right uh, has been allocated. And this, uh, when it's done, it should take into account possible user conflicts, availability and mobility of uh, available fishery species that are, have been included in the basket of species so that we don't allocate an area to a community where there's no uh, the kind of fish that they would like to to harvest. And lastly, it also provides for the general management of the small-scale fishing rights. Uh, for example, um, species that are to be harvested and prohibited ones, and various uh, methods that are acceptable, as well as the vessel types and limitations to, just to list a few. Uh, I think I'm getting closer to my end of the chair. Uh, in terms of cooperative governance, uh, when we implement the Act, chair, we work mainly uh, very close with uh, provincial departments of uh, environment, 
and uh, coastal municipalities, particularly in the implementation of the small scale uh, fisheries policy. Chair, we work with the Department of Petition in the registration of small scale fishers and support programs. Uh, law enforcement agencies such as the South African Police Services and the Municipal and Metropolitan Police uh, Services in law enforcement. And we also work with uh, the South African Revenue Services and Customs when it comes to importations of fishery species and exportation. And uh, subsidiaries such as uh, Sun Parks, Sunbi, and we also work very closely with the South African Maritime Safety Authority. And globally, Chair, we also work with Interpol on law enforcement and very closely with a regional fisheries management organization in managing uh, the shared fisheries uh, resources. Uh, Chair, on my last slide, uh, there's a number of challenges that we experience in implementing the Act. I, I, I can't list all of them, but I've just chose a few that I think are of importance. Uh, unlike a, a lot of resources, fish resources are, are finite, and there's not enough fish share to allocate or accommodate everyone. As the increased with uh, resources for livelihood uh, also increases, and the consequences of this uh, is increased poaching and other various forms of uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So with declining resources and allocations, Chair, we have also noticed a lot of consolidation of uh, fishing rights as well as uh, operations by right holders. Uh, there's been situations of reports of fishing processing establishments, uh, mainly around coastal towns that are closing down and consolidating towards metropolitan areas like uh, Cape Town and some of those areas where these uh, factories are closed. Those are areas that have been identified as initially uh, being economically depressed and were intended rights were allocated in those areas with the hope that they will promote economic activities in those areas. And chair, also the issue of uh, law enforcement, a uh, lack of financial and human capacity. It's a known fact that uh, law enforcement requires a lot of physical resources as well as human uh, resources. As we speak, uh, uh, from branch fisheries perspective, our operations are not exactly aligned to the operations of the industry. The industry tends to mainly operate uh, for 24 hours, for example, and for various reasons that we, we have cited, uh, the department is not in a position to provide a 24-hour compliance uh, services, where we also know that, uh, on the other hand, poachers also operate for, for, for 24 hours. And Chair, I've also uh, selected uh, the issue of health and safety, as there are endless reports of unfair labor practices in the fishing sector, both on land and at sea. And I'm aware that some of those have been reported to uh, this committee as well. Uh, Chair, enforcing conditions of employment at sea has always been a, a challenge as uh, most of this non-compliance uh, occurs at sea, and the Department of Labor does not necessarily have enough capacity and jurisdiction uh, on board the, the fishing vessel. So with regards at least to the enforcement at sea, I, I, I can clearly report that uh, the International Labor's uh, Organization's Work in Fishing Convention number 188 
uh, entered into force on the 16th of November 2017 in South Africa. And South Africa is a signatory to that convention. And the convention chair sets out uh, the binding requirements to address the main issues concerning uh, work on boat fishing vessels, including occupational self uh, safety and health, also medical care at sea and ashore. Also speaks to rest periods and also talks to work written agreements so that people are not just employed at sea without any written documentation. Chair, it, the convention chair aims to ensure that uh, also the vessels are constructed and maintained uh, in such a manner that fishers are having a decent living conditions on board. And in its implementation, I'm aware that uh, there's been a number of cases in South Africa where vessels have been refused to sail or go to sea uh, because of non-compliance by, by some time. Then the uh, launch, uh, which is also a very clear objective of the Act, uh, it's fraud within sector. Uh, assessments chair have been, uh, and they have established that salaries and levels of literacy in the fishing sector are very low. And as such, chair, there's a lot of unscrupulous service providers that uh, defraud, uh, particularly during uh, uh, rights allocation process. It's a lot of fraud with regards to shareholding and fronting and uh, of the, uh, the fish HDI historically disadvantaged fisher folks that we are trying to to empower and some of them once they have been assisted and have uh, fishing secured fishing rights they are bound in, into catching agreements and processing agreements and marketing agreements uh, that are for a very, very, very long time and are not uh, conducive to, to the development of the historically disadvantaged individuals that uh, we are trying to empower. And Chair, I think that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Thanks to you and to all the members. And I think I've covered uh, almost all the important things about the Marine Living Resources Act. Thanks. Chair, Chair, are they? Honorable okay. okay. Kaza. Chair. Chair, should we go? Should we go ahead and ask questions? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Honorable Lorimer, are you going to go first? <laughs> Oh, so like, why, why, thank you. Uh, and after Honorable Larimer. Uh, who is coming first is Honorable Paulson. I will have a question, please. Who is number two? Larimer, Chair. Larimer, number three. Honorable Winkler, please. Honorable Winkler, you are coming in for the first time, yeah? Any other hand? Okay, let's start, uh, Honorable Paulson. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for that comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. And uh, my first question is about the Marine Living Resources Act in itself. And you know, and I, and this is a dubious act, and I think many small-scale fishers feel the same way I do, simply because at the very outset it excluded small-scale fishers. So if it had included small-scale fishers, there would have been uh, public engagements, they would have been given an opportunity to give input, because many of these small-scale fishers are traditional fishers, artisanal fishers. It's a, a skill that has gone from generation to generation. So my first question is, do you think that this Marine Living Resources Act is of any benefit to South Africans? 
bearing in mind you said that this that we've not done a, an economic impact of this particular uh, act um, the other question is shouldn't we since small scale fishers do not have the resources that the larger fishing corporations have shouldn't we do what the Canadians have done, for example, whereby we allocate 50% of all fishing allocations to indigenous fishers, local fishers, people who have been fishers because it's the tradition in their families. Um, that's also um, the Marine Living Resources Act speaks about a fishing transformation council. And this was something that the former minister was going to implement and is even advertised for, for, for applications to serve on the fishing transformation council. The new minister has come along and scrapped the fishing transformation council. Council, is this it is this is this not illegal for the new minister to scrap the fishing transformation council? Thank you. Okay, honourable Lorimer. Thanks, Chair. Um, questions on two areas. The one is a sort of fairly minor detail. Those um, receipts that you talked about, that system where. Um, commercial fish retailers uh, have to keep the receipts of uh, where they got the fish from. Um, do those receipts ever get inspected? Uh, generally, does that system work satisfactorily? It sounds quite a neat system, but does it work? Okay, that was number one. Number two concerns fees, um, both licensing fees and catch fees. Um, how often do they go up? Who decides? And when did they last go up? Thank you. Uh, Honourable Winkler. Thank you, Chairperson. Excuse my absence tonight. Uh, it's not that I haven't been here. It's my network's been very poor, so I couldn't really engage. Um, so the first question that I have regards the process by which uh, small-scale fishing rights are allocated. Um, a number of um, fishermen or fisher folk that traditionally fell under the subsistence fishing category um, and now abs absorbed under the small-scale fishing rights. They don't seem to know where these cooperatives are, um, how to access these cooperatives, how one goes um, to apply. They don't have access to the, um, I would say, electronic resources to apply, say, for instance, through the website and to get hold of the numbers for the various officials. So I feel that just by virtue of the fact that a lot of these are, are very traditional uh, generational fishing communities. They're not very, say, for instance, techno savvy. Um, so by virtue of that, they're excluded from actually uh, obtaining these rights. And how are we going to mitigate against that going forward so that they aren't forced to apply for recreational fishing permits um, and then sell their catches illegally to sustain their livelihoods? Then with regard to the challenges faced um, that the presenter outlined, there was the issue of, you know, limited stock, fishing stocks available. Um, and, you know, is there no way that a balance can obviously be struck between, you know, total allowable catch um, for in the commercial fishing sector? Um, and I would say then in the small scale and the subsistence fishing sector to really accommodate a lot of people um, who just either didn't qualify or yeah, can't get access to those small scale fishing rights. Um, and how can we then, as I say, absorb a lot of people who rely on subsistence fishing for livelihoods into alternative industries? Um, and do we have a, you know, a very detailed plan on that going forward? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we just respond from some of those? Chairperson? Before that, yes. Honorable, Honorable. Webb, Webb, Webb. 
No, it's Honorable Rabas Kahni. Oh, Rabas Kahni. Okay. Thank you. Chair, I want to uh, uh, just ask, there was a mention made of the aquaculture and the separation of the of the of the or separate bill. Um, I would like to know aquaculture, freshwater aquaculture. Will that stay with with that, and will uh, marine or saltwater aquaculture be under under fisheries, or will that be how will it work? And then um, who determines the uh, special aquaculture uh, areas, which act uh, is the, the, the framework for that. Uh, and then um, is there under this, uh, the, the, under this bill, uh, under this act, uh, written into the act, a specific formula that determine the stock uh, and 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 so that we so that it's easy for a department um, to to say uh, this should be the 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 quotas or this permit should not be given for in excess of this kind of tonnage and so on. Who is who is responsible to monitor the fish stock and uh, it, and and make sure. <clears throat> That uh, the stock is growing and or is 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 protected and not go beyond a certain um, whatever you call it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can we respond? Hello. Thanks. Yes. Uh... Uh, chair, I'm, 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 I'm on my mic. Uh, chair, I will start with, uh, I'll provide response in the same sequence that uh, that the honorable members have uh, provided the, the questions. Uh, the first one being with regards to the MLRA. Uh, chair, the act as it stood then, uh, was extremely beneficial and they were advanced uh, processes to amend the act. I think uh, all the internal consultation processes were completed. Uh, I think it was in 2014 chair when uh, it was about to be amended, but because of the extent of the amendments that were required, had the process gone through, it was going to delay the implementation of the small scale uh, fisheries. So most of those uh, issues that we have identified uh, are going to be part of the amendments that are, have been identified to, 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 to come through by the, the department as part of, of the review. So in truth, only the amendments that were pertaining to do with uh, and with small scale fishers were the ones that were undertaken to ensure that, that at least there is implementation thereof. But part of our legislative review, uh, the MLRA has been identified uh, and due for, for review. And chair, the second question with regards to, to the resources, uh, I think the second question is also related to the first question that was, uh, sorry, the second question that was uh, asked by Honorable Labus uh, The size of the cake uh, has not changed. The fact that there are more people now that we have to split the allocations between uh, does not mean that we have uh, more fish in the sea. So when we do a resource splits between the sectors, uh, for every person that we give or allocate to, uh, it translates to the fact that we must have taken from uh, someone. So in the implementation of small-scale fisheries, we are still going to have a conversation. We'll all agree that uh, the, 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 the small-scale fisheries is in its uh, infancy. So we are still going to have uh, those conversations when we are developing uh, the policies for the rights allocations as to 
uh, how much should be apportioned to, to the small scale fishing sector. So for every apportionment that will make, it will mean uh, there will be a, a deduction from other uh, sectors. And with regards to the Fishing Transformation Council chair, it was not disbanded recently. Uh, it was disbanded a long time ago, and the legal opinion that we received, I think, at the time, uh, has indicated that uh, the transformation, can the, the work that the Transformation Council should do uh, is currently, it's already uh, inculcated in the marine living resources as a function of the of the work that would have been done by the minister through through the uh, provisions of the marine living uh, resources act and on the questions raised by all this uh, the invoices at all times when fisheries control officers do their inspections and in all instances they also do a reconciliation to ensure that uh, what is in the invoices talks to what is uh, in stock by uh, the person because there are a lot of cases where uh, some of these restaurant hotels and along the coast uh, buy or take a lot of uh, the supply from recreational fishers without uh, any paperwork, work and they buy fish that they are not supposed to eat. So there is a lot of uh, inspections of, on, on uh, receipts and reconciliation. And then uh, with regards to, to fees, uh, currently the, the last time the fees were, were increased, uh, it was in 2010 for the, the, the levies, and then there was an increase, sorry, there, there was an increase, I think, in and around uh, 2013 on uh, permits, and there is also a, a planned uh, review of the entire uh, fee structure uh, in the next coming months when we do policies for the fishing rights allocations. Uh, the fees are also part of that review. And with regards to a question that was asked by Honorable Winkler uh, regarding access to information for coastal uh, communities. Uh, Chair, we do have a fisheries development officer that are deployed in coastal uh, areas to assist in dissemination of uh, information and administration of uh, fisheries uh, services. We also have a dedicated uh, small scale fisheries officials that are based uh, in uh, major nodal uh, coastal towns and uh, the fisheries development officers are supposed to be the ones that are assisting to facilitate uh, engagement between the fishermen and the department. We can make a database of those development officers available and their contact details uh, chair. And then uh, Honorable Labushkahne asked about uh, Culture. Uh, currently, uh, marine and freshwater aquaculture are residing with uh, the department and they are managed from the branch fisheries uh, management. We have a dedicated aquaculture unit that looks into uh, uh, freshwater and marine aquaculture. And they also administer the policy relating to the allocations of uh, fishing rights in the aquaculture sector that is guided, uh, or that policy also clearly stipulates uh, the process and areas that have been earmarked and identified and have already undergone uh, environmental impact assessment that, are suitable, that can be used suitably for, for aquaculture uh, purposes. 
And then there, there, there were two questions uh, on the stock status. Uh, currently, Chair Futurist <laughs> Research a Division within the branch is responsible for conducting uh, fisheries stock assessments. Uh, there are models that have been developed that you call them operation management procedures that assist us in setting uh, recovery targets of various fish species. And based on, on, on those recovery targets, that is uh, uh, how TACs are set. And in terms of uh, the, the data, there's various forms and ways the department is collecting uh, data. There is uh, data that we collect, uh, we call a fisheries independent data, which is the data that we collect with our fisheries research vessels. We have set uh, trans transects where we do a regular sampling and uh, take measurements. We also have uh, fisheries dependent data, which is that we collect through uh, fisheries or fishing notebooks. Uh, all vessels, all right holders are in a book where they have to record uh, all their catches and other associated. Uh, in relation to their cases. And these logbooks are submitted to, to the department on a monthly basis. And the information that is connected, uh, independent and uh, dependent data, is the data that goes into the uh, operation rules that uh, determines what becomes the, the GAC or the total allowable effort for, for the following. If by our law, depending on environmental conditions, the sampling that is done by our research vessels indicates that there's no abundance. Uh, mostly that would affect the allocations for next year. So normally the TAC will tend to go down the following year, any signs of decline in uh, production of stock. Thanks, Chair. Chair? Chair? Chair, it, uh, this is Sue Middleton. Um, can I just add um, uh, two things to what Sasa has said? Go ahead, Sue. Thanks. Um, firstly, uh, in terms of uh, Honorable Paulson's question on the Fishery Transformation Council, um, Honourable Paulson, I'm aware that you are you currently have uh, an oral question on the same issue, um, and that the minister will be responding to you in Parliament next week. Um, but as Sasa says, we have a, a legal opinion, and um, also the minister abolished the Transformation Council in terms of Section 37 of of the Act. Um, so uh, she is acting within the terms of the MLRA. And then I think um, I can see in the, uh, the chat that Honorable Winkler would like uh, a more substance to the, her question on alternative livelihoods. Um, and Honorable Winkler, this is quite a, a difficult um, issue. And the, uh, the department is currently developing an alternative livelihood strategy for coastal fishing communities that looks at activities such as boat building, net repairs, bait and tackle, uh, and so on. Um, and then obviously another component of alternative livelihoods would be um, aquaculture and fish farming and encouraging small growers to, to enter into the aquaculture space. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, is there any other, no other issue now? Uh, I'm saying we should, uh, 
Chip is in the middle of the The second round. <laughs> second round. Can I allow you that? Uh, you wanted to raise something, Honorable Paulson? Yeah, I I want to do also ask if you know the fact that most small scale fishes are paper quota holders simply because they don't have resources and uh, that they sell the the um, allocation to bigger fishing companies and what the department can do to assist them to become more self-sufficient or self-sufficient than harvest the allocations themselves. Can we respond to that? Any response? Sasa, do you want to take uh, that one or? No, you can take it as well if there's anything more. Okay. Um, Honorable Pawson, um, the small scale um, fishing rights are allocated to fishing cooperatives, and uh, small fishers are members of the cooperatives. And because we're talking about um, natural species, um, the cooperatives have to identify who will do the fishing on their behalf. And the, the rest need to support the cooperatives in, in other ways, either through processing um, uh, or, or flecking. Um, so each uh, member of the cooperative is allocated a role and responsibility so that everybody is active in, in supporting the, the cooperative. Um, the department is also in the process of entering into agreements with the NASH, uh, the Training Foundation, as well as the Department of Small Business Development to look at various support pack packages uh, for small scale fishers to assist them in developing skills in the extended value chain um, of the, the fisheries process and not just the catching itself, but also in most importantly, and this is where the value add comes in, in the marketing, um, processing and export. Um, sorry, my cat is jumping on my, on my computer. Uh, uh, um, processing, marketing and export of, um, of fish. I hope that answers your, your question. Uh, but there is a, we realize that unless we support um, the small scale um, sector for the next few years, um, they will um, struggle. And it's government's role and responsibility, along with um, that of the NGOs, to, to provide development support. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Okay, thank you very much, uh, honorable members and uh, acting DG and uh, other officials. Uh, at least this was a good exercise. This is our last day. I'm sure we'll be able to engage as to how best we can take forward this process in terms of some of the proposals that we're coming up. Otherwise, thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank Chair, I see you still online. It's um, acting DG. 
Um, we, we, uh, I'm sure you're aware, Chair, that there's still um, a few other pieces of legislation still left, um, but yeah. we'll take guidance from the, the area as to when we can present those, Chair. No, it's fine. We'll, we'll come up with a clear proposal when we look Thank at our program. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Much appreciated. Good night. Thanks.